Josh, you know I couldn't get past the first 10 hours of Tears of the Kingdom. You can't say that on television, Sam. What will the nerds think? And you know what? A weird amount of it has to do with this green gloop. Yeah, it's so gloopy. The first time I saw this stuff, I could not believe that this magical fantasy adventure game was having me connect together entire tree trunks using Ecto Cooler. Awesome, right? You like this? I think it's great. I just... Why is it toxic green? I get that you want players to see the attachment points, but why not red? Okay, no, red usually means broken, but why not like shiny gold, like the stop time ability? You don't like it because it's green? I don't like it because it's gross. It's baffling to me. The first time I glued two bridge pieces together, I thought, this, this is what they went with. It looks like the wad of chewing gum stuck under the desk in Bruce Banner's office. It looks like someone dumped cornstarch into a monster energy drink. It looks like Play-Doh did a tie-in deal with Shrek's earwax. Like, it's just so... Uh, kludgy? I hate that word. I kinda hate it too. I always thought it was pronounced kludgy, but apparently it's kludgy. And that's a horrible mouth sound that no one should ever make. It is kind of the perfect word, though. It looks kludgy and poofy. Why is it so gross looking? Why is it like this? You say that like they didn't do this on purpose, like the Tears of the Kingdom team with their collective centuries of game dev experience and Nintendo's gazillions of dollars to play with just forgot to ungreen the gloop. They wanted it to be like that. A ton of effort and resources went into that green gloop. Look how they render the goop breaking apart dynamically when you detach part of your build. Look at how they animate where the gloop would connect when you're attaching two objects together. Not just the connection points move, but the hypothetical gloop that would manifest if you made this choice is modeled and rendered on the fly. Polygon says they spent basically a whole year refining the physics engine, which sounds to me like they had a lot of time to make the gloop gloop differently if they had wanted to. No, I mean... Okay, that is really interesting, but I know that a lot goes into these games. I know they did this on purpose. They wanted it to look like this, and I can't figure out why. I mean, sometimes something ends up in a game because the developers were handed down a decision from on high, or they were trying to work around a technical limitation, or they cut corners while crunching to hit a deadline, but I can't imagine that any of these apply to the gloop. They did this gloop on purpose. And so I'm sitting here trying to build a sailboat, and why is it like this? Because it's not just the gloop. Why is any of this like this? So why did they... Look at it, Josh. So why did... Look they... at it. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. Put it away. I see it. So why did they choose for it to be like this? Exactly. No, why did they choose for it to be like this? We've already pointed out that they had a zillion years to make this game and a budget of all the money Mario could find in Crisis' sewers. I think it's really interesting that they could have made building pretty and smooth and easy, sleek and polished, but instead they designed a system that ensured that every single thing you ever build will be a Rube Goldberg machine that only has a 40% chance of working as intended. Right, yeah, there's two things there. There's the functionality of the thing you built, and then there's grinding my teeth together trying to build the damn thing. I think I just took a really long time to build intuition for how the systems worked, but instead of producing the joy of discovery, for me it produced frustration, mostly. Using the rotation controls felt like someone rearranged the neurons I used to control my fingers. Things snap together a bit unpredictably, or they don't fit the way you want them to. A lot of what you end up with is just, eh, good enough. For the first couple sailboats I built, I didn't realize the sail rotated to face the wind, so I'd just be scooting along, praying my stupid boat made it to the other side. And it's all smashed together with this freaking rancid sourdough starter. That green gloop just laughing at me. But I think they want it to be ridiculous. It's supposed to be silly, fun. Like sometimes you build a thing and you look at it and you hop on and you try to fly off and immediately flip upside down and your whole contraption falls apart and you laugh yourself silly while you roll down a hill thinking what kind of idiot would build something like that? Guys. What's, What's up, up hey? hey? We're kind of in the middle of something. No, it's on topic. I want to show you this cool thing I made. It's a bomb? It's a balloon. 
It's, it's a, a balloon, balloon bomb. bomb. <laughs> Why have you done this thing? I thought the bombs needed to go upstairs. Okay, bye! Anyway, I think that's kind of the charm of the gloop. It sets the tone of the whole build system. It's supposed to feel very DIY. More like an egg drop test in your high school physics class than an engineer conducting stress tests on a commuter bridge. Wait, isn't Hay an actual engineer? In real life, yes. In Zelda, definitely not. When the game first came out, a ton of the fun people were having online was just with weird shit they'd built. It's an in-game toy as much as an actual game mechanic. Like, south of Hyrule Field, there's this Goron just standing out by himself on a mountain next to, like, a hundred-foot-high bell. The Goron's like, you know what I like? Real loud dings. Well, you see how loud you can make that bell ding. Here's a bunch of crap. And basically, he asks you to build the fastest, heaviest rocket you can and just ding the shit out of his big bell. Why? Because Strayed the Goron says it's fun when bell go ding, and he's right. And if you ding the bell dong enough, you get a ruby, which is really almost nothing, like no particular reward. But people went bananas for this bell, culminating in this dude abusing a recall lock and fuse entanglement, two different version-specific glitches I do not understand, to carefully time a late-stage rocket boost on a max-out stack of giant stone blocks to get the highest possible score on a minigame that has no meaningful rewards, just because this friendly rock monster loves a good ding. I think the real point of the build mechanic is that it's fun. Like, it gives you these tools that you think will let you solve problems, and instead they... I made a bridge! And I made a bridge. Oh. <laughs> Looks great, hey? Like, that's a little bit fun, right? Yes, that was objectively good and what video games should be for. And I want to like this. There are even times when I feel like I do. I can see that it was supposed to be fun and playful, and I just wanted to use it to solve a problem. And that made me feel like a big, boring adult trying to turn a sandbox into a condo complex and being annoyed at the sand for being sand. A lot of the fun of emergent gameplay systems is trying something and watching it fail spectacularly. I had fun watching my friend try to build the tallest airplane he could build. It was fun watching someone play with the explicit goal of exploring the system's limits. And the gloop really is, like, the perfect representation of that crazed, mad scientist energy. It's the perfect embodiment of how the devs probably wanted players to think about the build system. I still think it looks whack, but I get it. And, okay... Fine. I had a lot of fun with my first Korak challenge. I had to get a guy across a river to find his friend, and I hot glued him to a log with the plan of making the log into a boat, but we quickly became besieged by bokoblins, and the log fell in the water, and I watched the Korok slowly and sadly float down the river, complaining about wanting to visit his friend, and in spite of myself, I was cackling. That's what I love about it. The number of times that I've carefully built a rocket contraption to get a Korok to its friend and then just watched helplessly as it careened off a cliff in the wrong direction is high enough that I'm pretty sure that's the point. Like, everything you build has the same feel as when my eight-year-old builds a weird contraption out of magnet tiles and is like, look at this cool thing, Dad, and I have no idea what it's supposed to do, but he sure did have fun building it. And if that's what I thought the game was, I'd be way into it. If Tears of the Kingdom was basically Scribblenauts plus Bionicles, then yes, okay, give me all the parts and all the flamethrowers. But man, it felt like the game couldn't decide whether the build system was something that should be relied upon to accomplish big boy adult tasks, or if it should be this unpredictable fun machine. It feels like a magic genie came to me and said, Shazam! You can build cool sculptures out of chocolate now. Whee! Now use it to repair your oil leak. You have work in 15. Like, is this supposed to be spontaneous and quirky, or am I supposed to use it to do useful things? Um, both? Both. Honestly, I think a lot of my problems with the build system are in how it was introduced in the early game. Back before you get steering sticks and powered wheels and stuff. The tutorial island presents you with your first contraptions, and they're, like, disassembled solutions. Like, I know that according to Bernard Suits, playing a game is the voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles, but, like, 
This does seem pretty unnecessary. Could have just given me a plank with a hook. Not feeling super activated in the brain region right now. Just kind of feeling like I'm doing your chores, Raru. I saw the build system presented as a solution for solving traversal challenges. So I leave the tutorial zone and I'm not thinking, hooray, building stuff. I'm thinking, all right, this is how I get from here to there. And then the game says, oh, by the way, there are still horses and paragliders. And so I'm like, nice, okay, that also solves those problems. I get what you're saying, because yeah, this is a tutorial, and the purpose of a tutorial is to show the player what they'll be doing and how they'll be doing it. So what I learned from the tutorial is the build system was for reassembling functional solutions to small hurdles, not really expressing my creativity. For me, that came later. It didn't really take me a while to have the kind of spectacular bad ideas that I would have after I had some practice. <laughs> right, totally. And you could say it's 100% on me for not waiting long enough to see if the build system would grow on me. But like, how long is long enough? Is there a three episode rule for games? Some players more immediately and naturally got into the mindset of using this system to be creative. Like my friend who saw the wings and immediately went, how can I make this as stupid as possible? And I think those people are correct, but that was not the mindset I was in. For real, sometimes the unveiling of these new elements felt a bit <laughs> unenthusiastic. When I first used the wing, I was kind of uninspired, not gonna lie. Remember the first time we used the paraglider in Breath of the Wild? They presented that like the magic it was. And then Tears of the Kingdom rolls up brand new traversal mechanic in hand and goes, and you're like, wow. Cool. But so we've got the fan carts, the hook boards, the log boats, the wing rail, the log, log, log board boards. The tutorial and the trailer nonstop present this build system as if it's integral to exploring this world. It's the new status quo for traversal. And so I tried, Josh, I tried to suspend my skepticism and do the game on the game's terms. The first time I drop down into Hyrule, I see all this neat stuff and sure, I know these piles are nominally for the Hyrule restoration effort, but girl, you can't trick me. This is just a disassembled car nicely stacked. So, all right, I'll give it a shot. Let's do it. Let's make us a car. And then I make the car and it sucks. I don't have an engineering degree from Zonai University. Everything I build sucks and I'm just missing the paraglider because it was fun and good at stuff and both of those at the same time. Sam, you know you get the paraglider back, right? For our own safety, we need to make sure the nerds know you played long enough to get the paraglider back. Yeah, and as soon as I did, I was like, fuck all this shit. Because I'd spent the last two hours with a fan strapped to my shield trying to get my goat-made paper airplane to slide off a hill in the direction I wanted. Starting the player off with a bad airplane seems way more likely to make them miss the paraglider and then be really happy when they get the paraglider back and then not want to fuck around anymore with making bad airplanes. Like, no, I'm good. I'm good now, thanks. See, to me, it feels like a natural extension of Breath of the Wild. That game was all about traversal. There has never been anything quite like the paraglider in Zelda games, and so Breath of the Wild was built around making sure Link had interesting places to paraglide to and interesting ways to gain altitude to glide to them. And then Tears of the Kingdom is just yes-anding Breath of the Wild like a middle schooler who just learned about improv. What if things were high? Yes, and what if there were higher things? And what if there were things above those things? What if Korok? What if two Korok? What if towers you could climb? Yes, and what if they shot you into outer space? But God, the traversal mechanics in Breath of the Wild were tight because it was all stamina. Run, stamina. Climb, stamina. Fly, stamina. Swim, stamina. Yes, we all know you like the stamina. No, 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 no. Yeah, yes, I do. But now it's all that plus, what if I made an airplane? What if I made a hover scooter? What if I made a car? And it doesn't feel as tight to me. See, I think this is where the sequel baggage becomes most apparent. If Tears of the Kingdom hadn't been a sequel to a game with horses and a paraglider, it would not have had horses and a paraglider because they undermine the build system. They don't fit into its design ethos. 
I know being a sequel is hard, but you're already making this really bold decision, so go bolder. Take it all the way. Don't hedge your bets. Remove the horses, remove the paraglider. Make me use your cool thing. Force me to fly the way you want me to fly now. Yeah, 90% of the time, if I'm just trying to get from here to there, I'm still just paragliding. Right, it's fun to be forced to MacGyver a solution together from rubber bands and flubber, but if you give me a pre-built solution, I will use it. I'm still gonna prioritize the option that will work for me now, not the option I'll have to finagle and test for five minutes, as fun as that might be. Yeah, I think that's why the auto-build system exists. Like. The nerds of the internet pretty much agree that the perfect flying machine is a hover bike, two fans trapped to the front and back of a steering stick. Except for the nerds who believe in the Green Goblin scooter, who we will hear from in the comments. But the thing about the hover bike is that it's cumbersome to build. You have to get the angles just exactly right and the connection points perfectly centered, and probably to get a really good one, it takes time and patience, and maybe a sacrificial steak, and maybe a sacrificial goat, and <laughs> definitely an impractically flat surface, and probably you have to follow a tutorial. But once you build it perfectly that first time, you can favorite it in your auto build menu. And now you have it forever. You don't need to build a flying machine anymore because you have the perfect one. Check, done. Every problem can be solved with the exact same doohickey. Is, is that a good thing? Well, I thought it was until about two seconds ago. That just doesn't feel like it's a selling point for the build system. It feels like, oh, if you use our fun build system enough, soon you won't have to use it. We're gonna make this an integral part of the game, but also we'll give you auto builds so you can kind of ignore it. This is the problem with players like me. You give us a mechanic that's a bit annoying on purpose because it's funny when it fails, but often we just wanna finish the task we're thinking about, get to the place we're trying to get to, defeat the thing we're trying to defeat. And if you give us other more reliable or easier options for doing those things, if you give us alternatives that are neither annoying nor funny, players kind of have a tendency to optimize that fun out as being unnecessary. It's hard to force myself to use the thing that would be fun if I had to experience its quirky, quirky failures. Right. They do give you a way to build yourself out of having to use the build system, and that does feel kind of weird. But I will say, even with auto build, there are still some times when the game forces you to have fun by making a fool of yourself. Late in the game, there's a moment where you have to gather four very large, very heavy crates and somehow hump them across several hundred yards of enemy-infested gloom lands. And so, like the lazy little elfling the game has taught me to be, I plonk down my mightiest flying machine, get out my magic hot glue gun, stick the crate to the bottom, and take off, and it is way too heavy. So here I am, careening ass over tea kettle into a swarm of angry bacoblins who beat me to death with ladle hose while I'm still trying to figure out which part of my caroming ragdoll body is supposed to hold a sword. Probably the hardest I've ever left on a game over screen. It's still fun. Even 90% of the way through the game, when I think it's all figured out, it's still fun. Okay, last one. What if minecart but wheels for make better? He's still using it and I'm pretty sure he's beaten the game. <sighs> I'm happy my friends like it. It is okay if something is not for me. I'm just not an internally motivated player. I kind of wish I was, honestly. I really respond to solving problems in games, and it's hard for me to get excited about solving a problem that I invented. Like, how do I farm as many bacoblins in my boxcar as possible? Or how do I torture the NPCs who come to visit my house? I think Tears of the Kingdom is built for internally motivated players, at least in this sense. The players who will do whatever they want to do right now, regardless of what the official quest line or progress markers are indicating. But I do think you're right, at least in that the game had so many chances to let us use the build system to actually solve problems, and then it just, you know, didn't. For as much fun as I had with the build system and its gloopy gloop, there was this one moment where it seemed like the game wanted me to forget the build mechanic even existed. The Ring Ruins in Kakariko Village. I feel like you've told me this story before. I like to complain about it. So when you get to Kakariko Village, there's this big ruin floating up above the town, and you're like, okay, that's new. It very much feels like I'm supposed to go explore that. So you head over to it, and there's this angry little dweeb who says, if it's off limits to an archaeologist like me, it certainly applies to an amateur like you. So you think, like, obviously, what I'm supposed to do is 
build a thing. The game has given me the tools I need to succeed. I can contrapt. So, I don't know, you glue a fan to a mop and a board or whatever, and you clumsily putter your way up there, and then you just suddenly freeze in midair. Or and the dweeb yells, hey, get down here, and Link just does. You get teleported down to the angry nerd who shakes a finger at you and calls you a bad boy. Bad Link, no. I thought I was being super clever. I thought I'd figured out the secret message the game was trying to wink, wink, nudge, nudge at me. He can't build a flying machine, but I can. Okay, all right, game, I'm picking up what you're putting down. Or Wait, game, was that not what you wanted me to do? I thought we had a connection here. That guy wasn't an obstacle. He's the supreme authority? Okay. Like they give you this powerful, if kinda wonky tool for solving problems, and then they don't even let you solve problems with it. It just feels a bit whiplashy. See, this is wild because I remember Ego Raptor complaining about this exact same thing in a video 10 years ago about Ocarina of Time, a game that came out 20 years ago. Look. You go to Kakariko Village. You go to the entrance of Death Mountain. Dude won't let you pass. There's a tiny wall standing between me. I could climb over it. I'm an agile kid. I could climb the shit out of that. Except in this instance, the game really did give you the tools to be the master of your own destiny, only to say, nope, this guy, he is the master of your destiny. Also, also, uh. it's hilarious that he wouldn't just let you into the ring ruins. Like, not to be that guy, but... Does he know who you are? Do you know who I am? I literally just saved the whole world. You're telling me I can't go in there? Okay, yeah, that's another weird thing. Can we please talk about how weird that is? About how the game is a little rough as a sequel, narratively speaking? Yes, please. You want to reconvene in, oh, say, right after the Patreon credits? Absolutely, I'll go make some popcorn. 